Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Happy Mum, Happy Baby, the podcast. Today's guest is a TV presenter. He's a radio DJ. He has his own parenting podcast called Parenting Past the Pandemic, which I listen to and absolutely love. Even though this is all about being a parent and having children, it's amazing how much you can get from other conversations that are done in a different way. So I absolutely love that. He is my mate because we spent three weeks together in a castle. Uh, but more than that, he is dad to two amazing girls. It's Bird and Kay. Oh, whoop, whoop. Whoop, whoop. Uh, this no, is lovely. Is it, <laughs> I, I, well, you know, if no one else, that's a lesson in life, G, is if no one's going to give you a fanfare, give yourself one. I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> Nice. I'm really excited about this because, you know, we spoke a lot intimately in the castle, which never got aired. Mm. And we had some really good, honest, open conversations. And uh, it's just nice to to now sit with a mate and have a chat. It's really because going into the castle, I think, and I've said this to you a couple of times, I think I thought what what I assumed you were going to be one thing. And actually you were... So, and not th- to say that you weren't going to be this, but actually the big characteristics that shone through for me, for you, were the fact that you were so thoughtful, so, you, like, you know everything about everything, but in <laughs> not an arrogant way. Like, I've sent you pictures of things in my toolbox downstairs and gone, Vernon, I don't know what this is, <laughs> and you helped out. You know, you're such a dad in that really pragmatic, practical way that's really, really helpful. But also there was a, a softness with you that just shone through whenever you talked about your family and whenever you talked about your girls yeah I think I think all of that what you've just described is uh testament to the way I was brought up by my mum and dad by Gladys and Norman uh everything was always open everything was always there was a work ethic of work hard you yeah. know especially from my dad's side he was he's a or he was a he's retired now he's a lorry driver so he was always out on the road grafting and As kids, my brother and I, I've got a younger brother called Stephen who's three years younger than me. He's a teacher in Dubai. We never wanted for anything. It was always like they worked so hard to provide what they could for us. Like Christmases, and we spoke about Christmas because I know Tom (laughs) loves Christmas a lot. Christmas was always a special time in our house because mum and dad worked to that point where Christmas was just amazing. Honest, it, it was It was everything a child could ever want for at Christmas where they'd never wrapped the presents and we lived in a a small three-bedroomed house detached up in in Horwich near Bolton and tiny rooms and and you, you went down the stairs and then immediately at the bottom of the stairs was a door to the left which went straight into the living room and the living room was like the main floor at Hamley's because they didn't wrap any presents up. Everything was just in front of you. So there was that... Kind of minute of <laughs> complete exasperation of like, oh my gosh. When you look back, you think, oh my God, how did they do that? You kind of take it on board and, and you want the best for your kids because your parents wanted the best for you. Yeah, absolutely. And then I've got to say, actually, you talked about your mum and dad a lot in there. Yeah, they're and- brilliant. They're honest. And I know. A lot of people have family woes and and family issues, but we never had any in our house. Uh, Mm. It was all about dad going out, lorry driving, making a living. He was also in a band, uh, so he was gigging every Friday and Saturday night for extra cash. Mum worked in a department store, always there on the school run, always picked us up. And then when we got a little bit older and she slowly unraveled the leash, (laughs) we we, we were able to walk home from school. Uh, but yeah, nothing but love in our house. Yeah. It, re- it really was. It was amazing. Um, and looking back, I think sometimes when you go through those teenage years and you go through your twenties, and it's, I think it's only about mid thirties where you start to reflect and realize how much hard work your parents put into your upbringing. Yeah, you know, yeah. and that's when you kind of start, I guess, really throwing an arm around them and mollycoddling them. I guess. Well, was did that coincide with you becoming a dad as well? No, 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 not really. I think when we fell pregnant, oh, when the test fell pregnant, but I think you say we, don't you? Because it's all one unit. That's when I kind of was like, I picked the phone up to me and was like, right, what do I do here? What's what, what's all this about? And uh, there are there are so many manuals out there and there's so many ways 
and ideas. That's that's yeah. the thing about parenthood. There are so many different opinions and ideas. And yes, mm. they're all wonderful and they're all great. But the one that actually worked for you was the one that your mum and dad did. So I just phoned my mum and dad up and, and said, right, what's going on here? And my mum went, oh, don't listen to him. Did bloody nothing. He would always do bloody road. <laughs> my mum said that. I can remember when um, when Buzz came along and my dad had looked after him and he changed his nappy. And mum was like, oh, he never changed any of your nappies. I can't believe he's doing it now. <laughs> <laughs> he would never hear. Always do bloody yeah. road. That was so funny. Uh, but yeah, so I think those that big. I remember that big phone call telling my mum that we were going to have a baby and she was over the moon, over the moon. Oh. And when when Phoebe was born. I'll never forget it. It was so funny. When Phoebe was born, she said, oh, well, you know what? Today we'll leave, we'll leave it to you. We'll let you settle in. Uh, and we'll come either tomorrow or the day after. I was like, yeah, no problem. Totally up to you. Within three and a half hours, they were knocking on the, hot, on the <laughs> hospital, hospital door. <laughs> Where are you? I thought you weren't coming. Oh, I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait. Oh. It was amazing. And they brought Tessie's mum as well. It's funny because I had exactly the same experience where all four parents turned up. I mean, I'd literally just been st- like I was still everything out, and then I could hear my dad's booming voice in the in the corridor. And it is that thing of I think at the time you're like, oh, you know, I just want to sort this out a bit. But then having children, like then having children and seeing them grow up, you realise that you want to be there for all those things. Yeah, because- yeah. They're always going to be your Me- child, your baby. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, Phoebe's now sixteen, and she's at that stage where she's booked tickets to festivals and music gigs <laughs> and this, that, and the other. And I remember her first festival will be Reading Festival, which was my first ever festival. Yeah. Uh, and it rained, and it was dank, and it was dark, and you know, everything that goes on in a festival went on at a festival, and I saw it and witnessed it, and it was quite daunting. I remember. So I think this time. I think it's just an excuse for me to go to Reading Festival, but I'm going with her. (laughs) She said, you can't follow me around. You've got to leave me alone. I said, don't worry. I will park myself somewhere in front of a stage or do something with a friend. I said, but if you need me, I'm there. Yeah. You know, uh, but yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to the next journey. Yeah, well, so let's start to this. Let's go to the start of it all. Did you and Tess sit down and kind of go, like, oh, did you, what did you think about being a dad? Did you have a, an idea of what or when you wanted a family? Or was it a case of you and Tess going, well, should we just go go now? Or No, yeah. it was never it was never planned. It, but I think uh, like it, we were married. We, we had Phoebe a year after we got married, which yeah. is quite quick, really, because at yeah. the time, quite it was quite quick for us because we we had such a good time going travelling. You know, and doing mad stuff. We were still going clubbing. We were still partying (laughs) and all the wild stuff that you do before you have a baby. Um, And it was really rock and roll. Um, And then when Phoebe was born, it was like, oh, man, we've got to go from fifth gear to first gear. And we've got really like kind of there's someone else with us now. So it's not about us anymore. It's about us and the baby. Um, And that transition was really fun in that it was like, Sometimes we just forget that we had a baby. It's like, oh, let's go out for dinner. Yeah, book a restaurant. I can have a table for two, please. Oh, don't! No, three, and we need a high chair. Is there anywhere we can park the pram? Uh, you've got changing facilities in the bathroom. Uh, how close are you to a hospital just in case yeah. anything happens? You know, and then everything. So I think once you get through that checklist yeah, uh, and the regularity of the use of that checklist, everything just settles and you're all right. But... Uh, yeah, it wasn't planned. It was just kind of, it just happened, I guess. And how did you feel when you heard the news? Oh, I was over the moon. I was over the moon. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, and I've told the gang this, I, I was really hoping that I'd have a boy first. Really? Yeah, so a boy that would look after either the girl or the younger brother right. uh, that, that came next. Did you we, always know that you wanted two? We always wanted two, because we were, we're from families of two, you see. It's funny, you ha- you want what, you, what you've what you experienced yeah. most of the time. Yeah, and I think... You know, I said it earlier on, When the way you are brought up is a reflection of the way that you were brought up. Sorry, the way that yeah. you bring your kids up is a reflection of the way you were brought up. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we always wanted to because I think uh, a pal for yeah. the, the kids. It's nice to have someone to play with. I, I grew up playing with my brother. We, we've got very similar likes and dislikes. And Tess was the same with her sister, Karen. Very similar personalities, but they like different things which is mm-hmm. great, you know, it, it really is. So we definitely wanted two, and uh, we got two. 
yeah, we've got two <laughs> girls. And, and at, at the time, you know, I was like, oh man, I'm never going to go to football. I'm never going to do this, that and the other. But as a dad with two daughters, it's, I, I, and from what I've heard from pals who've got sons, it's a completely different experience, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and people will disagree with me, but I, I don't know because I've never had two sons. But what I've witnessed and being one of two sons is a completely mm. different experience. It's funny, isn't it? People say like, because obviously I've got three boys. People say, you know, you, you know, but three girls might be just as wild and chaotic and, and manic and whatever else. And then I'm like, but I don't see that when I go out and I see people with girls. They're all sat down coloring and it's delightful and just really nice and they're conversing and yeah. it's, it's civil. But in my lot, they're just thumping each other. And I can remember the other day. I was in Cornwall and I saw a, a mum and dad and their two sons who must have been sort of early 20s and they were just crossing the road. It was eight o'clock in the morning and one of the other, one of the brothers just like hit the other brother in the tummy for no reason at all. And I was like, oh my gosh, they're never going to grow out of this. <laughs> they're constantly going to be hitting each other. Yeah, well, we, we've been to parties where there's been lots of young boys there and they're doing what young boys do, you know, scrapping and, and running around. And the girls are just sat down being yeah. placid and talking and just doing girl stuff, mm. you know, uh, yeah. and, and just girls being girls. like, yeah. And it's amazing to watch because there, there's a massive difference, a massive mm. difference between the carnage and chaos that boys create <laughs> and the serenity that, well, our girls in particular and their mates create. It's, it's yeah. just, uh, and now, that, it, now that, that Phoebe's getting 16, I've noticed that, they do the same in that they sit and chat, but they chat about life. They chat about chat about stuff. Yeah. You know, and I think that the conversations that I'm overhearing are a lot more open than the conversations that we were having when I was uh, 16. And I wonder if that's a general thing anyway, because they I are, so. you know, the world is a much smaller place now. They're, they're aware of things that are going on far more than we would have been growing up. So I wonder if that is, you know, hopefully boys are doing the same thing and chatting and talking through what's happening in the world. I was out recently and I spoke to um, a couple of ladies from the Mind Charity. Oh, yeah. And they were saying that blokes still find it difficult to talk about, you know, mental health and stuff. Yeah. And I, it, it was like, well, I know we're going off on a little bit of a tangent, but for me, it's all about how strong your friendship group is. Mm. You know, if you don't have the confidence in the people around you to talk about your issues, then I hate to say it, I think you're with the wrong people. Yeah, you know, my I've got five solid mates who I can ring up at any time, and we can have a "how are you" chat. Yeah. You know that kind of "how are you" conversation. But that must be lovely then when you see Phoebe talking. Oh with yeah, her yeah, mates. yeah. She's really sensible and she's very pragmatic and she's very open to opinion, but she likes her own. <laughs> uh, who does she get that from? Your uh, test. Oh, that's definitely Tess. <laughs> uh, but I think it, you know it's really interesting to see how her friendship groups are panning out, and they're all like we're really confident that the girls are just they're going to be all right. Uh, they talk to each other. Vernon, what were you like going towards the birth, like towards D Day? You knew it was coming. We were, we no. were excited. We were excited because the first one we had a cesarean, so everything was kind of on the money. And then the doctor, uh, he was so relaxed. He was singing, I'll never forget it, singing Whitney Houston songs. I'm like, this is, I don't want my baby brought into the world hearing Whitney Houston, I want to dance with somebody. I'm like, come on. It's a great song. It is a great song. But at the time, it was like, can we put some dance music on so that it's got rhythm when it comes out the womb? Uh, And that, that was a bit weird. That was a memory that will stick with me forever. And then Tessie's epidural fell out. So they were prodding around trying to get that back in, which was a bit weird. Yeah. Um, and also at that point, it's something that neither of you ex- have experienced before. It's also unknown. So you're kind of being pulled around a bit or just k- taking people's advice because you've got no idea yeah. and what's like, meant to happen. And all you hear about the epidural is, oh, if he's one millimetre away, you could be paralysed for life. Yeah. You know, and all that kind of stuff. So that's running through your mind. Then is the baby all right? Yeah, the heart rate is all right, this, that and the other. And then you're like, oh, <laughs> uh, but when it arrived, we said, "What is it?" Because we didn't, we didn't, we never found out whether it's going to be a boy or a girl. And he went, "It's a pink one." And <laughs> they're all pink. <laughs> what does that mean? Do you know what I mean? I'm like, "What? <laughs> pink? Yeah, what is it? It's a girl." <laughs> oh, right. 
frightened the life out of me. I'm like, what? He said, what? Uh, but yeah, no, and then that was it then. You're up and running. You are up yeah. and running. From the moment it takes its first breath, you are up and running. And then you go through the stage of, you know, the umbilical cord. And then Did you, you go... cut the umbilical cord? Uh, oh, it's really sad. I can't remember. Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. But we kept Even it. Even the fact that that's blue. I know. That is so like crazy. It goes on forever. It's blue. Yeah. Yeah. But we kept we kept the umbilical cord for the stem cell stuff. Yeah. We did all of that. And then it's kind of over to you. And I've got for actually the laptop that I'm on, uh, the one video that always pops up when my laptop is turned on, bizarrely, and I don't know why, is Phoebe's first ever bath. Oh. So that comes on and she's crying away and you know, and the nurse is literally drowning her. I'm like, wait, that's too much water. It's too much, too many bubbles. What are you doing? <laughs> No, she'll be all right. She's just come from water. She'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Okay. I always find it fascinating, though, how rough the midwives are with the babies because they, they're with them all the time. They know they're a bit more robust than we think they are. Exactly. Because we do think they're so fragile. And then you're scared to put their hand in a piece of clothing. You know, you're scared to do everything. Yeah. And they're but shoving they're... their arm into a little jacket <laughs> yeah. or whatever. You're like, whoa, easy. Calm down. Yeah. And then you go through the yellow, black, green poo phase. <laughs> yep. And then once that disappears, you actually have a human on your hands <laughs> instead of an alien. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was that day was was something special. It really was, and uh, I'll never forget it. But I, I'm quite disappointed in myself because I get the two intertwined. But I guess that's a time thing, isn't it? It's yeah. You know, so your memory can only do so much. Yeah, because there was one where the FA Cup final was on, uh, Amber. And uh, I was in the pub until I got a phone call because I was really jittery for the second one. Why? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Tess said, you've got to go. You've got to leave. You've just got to leave. So I left and there was a pub around the corner. So I went and watched the first half of the FA Cup final. Uh, and the second one was a natural birth. And very kind of Amber to arrive during halftime. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, and she's been the same ever since. Always thinking of her dad. <laughs> <laughs> but you managed to get back in time. I got to back be in there. I, yeah, so I, I rushed back and everything was great. And and, and uh, yeah, Aunt Tess was a million dollars after the natural birth compared to the cesarean for obvious reason. Um, and we were kind of like, oh man, wish we'd had a natural birth first. But the thing is, I think there's so much around that, isn't there, where. C-sections have this stigma which they simply shouldn't have because it's major surgery. Oh, you know, yeah, no it one is. goes into that light-hearted thinking. No, well, this but is people think that it's apart. easier to have a C-section uh, than more than a natural birth. But a C-section is major, major surgery, and you can't yeah. do anything for weeks after. Uh, and then with Amber, we're up and running straight away. But was Phoebe like meeting Amber? Well, Phoebe at the time had a lot of dolls and a lot of prams, a lot of cuddly stuff. So it was like that scene out of E.T. As soon as we got home, it was dolls. And then, where's the baby? Oh, it, uh, <laughs> it's in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got lots of pictures of her holding Amber. And, and still, their bond is really tight. Mm -hmm. Really, really tight. You know, some of the stuff they talk about, I'm like, I wonder if I ever talked about that with my brother. Because we were always just like sport. We, well, we were predominantly vehicles in our house because yeah. my dad was a lorry driver. So it was always trucks and then a little bit of sport, lots of television, lots of movies, that kind of stuff. And um, whatever one is doing, the other one will try and join in. So Amber's mm -hmm. very arty and very creative and Phoebe will try and join in and make a necklace or some pottery or whatever. And then the flip side, Phoebe being 16, it's all about fashion, trends, clothing yeah. so then amber joins in and she's like no no no, i just want black i'm just gonna wear black jeans black t-shirt <laughs> i'm like yeah <laughs> rock and roll bring on the eyeliner dad will have some of that <laughs> well now that you are surrounded by girls because there is this there, there is a thing where people are disappointed with you know having a girl if they wanted a boy or the other way around and um you know because I, my whole thing was always, um, you know, I'm just there's there's the whole narrative, isn't there, isn't there? That I've got, I'm just so lucky to have a baby when there's so many people that can't. And um, but actually, you're you, we start dismissing some big topics actually where people do genuinely feel really quite lost or, or, or upset that they haven't got what they had ideally wished for in whatever way. Um, 
was that something that slipped away as soon as they arrived? Oh, 100%. 100%. But it does, I'll be honest with you, it does come back. It does come back. Like, does anyone want to come to watch England with me? <laughs> no. Does anyone want to come to the American football with me? It'd be stupid. Does What's anyone... that what we said about the boys coming over to yours? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, we could do this and we could do that. Gee, listen, I have a, I have, and everyone says, whenever their sons come to our house, they don't want to leave. Because whatever <laughs> I intended to be for a son, bought for myself. <laughs> so, because... I'm not Tess is the artistic one in the family. She's an amazing drawer. She a really good cartoonist, Tess. So her and Amber do that. Phoebe and I are music and fashion and and you know, dad taxi, that kind of stuff. And we get on really, really well. But there's always that side of a dad where you're like, let's go and build a rope swing. Do you know what I mean? Let let's 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 do something. Let's get a paintball gun. Yeah. Uh so we, we where we live, the woods, the forest nearby. There are numerous rope swings, old and new, which I've <laughs> on play dates. Like, right, come on, rope swing time. Let's go and build a rope swing. And then we've got like uh, radio controlled airplanes. Girls, do you, want, do you want me to teach you how to fly a drone? No, you're all right. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. They've both got, in all fairness, you know, uh, they've both got a pretty decent golf swing. So I'm very proud of that. That's nice. Yeah. Uh, but I think it, it doesn't bother me anymore because they're, they're both great kids. And yeah. and what I would have got from going to football practice or teaching them more golf, I get from conversation now. Yeah. You know, because we, we've, last night we had a massive conversation, Phoebe and I, about the artist that she's going to see at Reading Festival. Then I started reminiscing about seeing Nirvana and Public Enemy at Reading Festival. And it'll, be ne- it'll never be the same. You know, that <laughs> kind of stuff. Uh, oh, Dad, shut up. What has been the most difficult stage of parenting for you? Yeah, I think there is that element now of of Phoebe's teenage years where there's a little bit of friction between her and mum. Yeah. You know, and that's just, I guess that's that moment where the separation from parents has has started. And people say, oh, listen, it will be absolute carnage. It'll get a lot worse, but they'll come back in two years. That's what we keep hearing from friends who've had real issues with either their sons or daughters being going head to head with mum or dad. Mm -hmm. And it's always only one. Uh. And they say, oh, don't worry, they'll come back. They will come back, cap in hand, and they'll apologise for how they've behaved. And everyone has said that. Everyone has said that. And I think what's different is, especially with Phoebe being older, is as a parent, you've fueled the car, you've put doors to manual and you've cross-checked. <laughs> you know, you, you've, you've uh, navigated your potential journey. You know where you're hoping to go. Mm-hmm. everyone's got their seatbelt on and now you turn the engine, you press the accelerator and off they go. And you just hope that they have put on their seatbelt, that doors are to manual and we have cross-checked. And when they come back every night or every day from whatever they're doing, they're safe and happy. Mm. And that that's the worry with, with kids is, have I said enough? Have I done enough? Do they know enough? Yeah. to be able to survive in the big, bright world, you know? Yeah. And you just yeah. hope that your kids don't bump into that person who has a uh, a negative influence on their lives. After everything you've taught them and everything that you've tried to install in them, that that person doesn't come around and say, oh, I, like, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? And swear them and, and, you know, turn the right dials to persuade them to do something that they shouldn't. Yeah. It's hard though, isn't it? Because ultimately we are all where we are because of whatever mistakes that we've made and you know we're all going to have those times where we feel out of our depth as a human and but it's that that makes us stronger that then makes us become the person that we are yeah so it, it's hard isn't it I think well um, then that, that, I think that go, then then it goes back to what we talked about earlier on having a strong friendship group yeah Having people, like, re- remember when you were at school, there was always that conversation. We had it in religious studies a lot. What would you do if one of your friends had really bad body odour? <laughs> I remember those. Think, well, I'm not telling them. <laughs> oh, oh, Gary, you, you do realise, mate, you stink. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Tried some of this Lynx Africa. Uh, but it, it's that, it, it's, it's those difficult conversations that you have to have with your friends. Yeah. 
But Phoebe, like like I said before, Phoebe's really mature. We're really, really proud of her. She, you know, she's and one thing that we talked about at the top of of, of the pod was work ethic and how yeah. my parents uh, had an amazing work ethic and the way that she put the work into her GCSEs. Uh, I now feel confident that she's not shy of hard work. Yeah. You know, because regardless of what the results would have been or could have been, the fact that she sat every night for a long, long period of time and grafted hard, revising, she's now uh, programmed herself to realise what it is to work like that. So I'm really happy with that. Uh, Is fatherhood, Vernon, is fatherhood what you thought it would be? Oh, it's better. 100% 100% better than what I expected it to be. Yeah, because it's all, it's a constant work in progress. Mm. Do you know what I mean? You're, no day is like yesterday. Yeah. It's always different. There's always something that crops up. There's always something uh, that needs to be said. And there's a lot of fun to be had as well. Let's not forget that. And I've, I've been quite lucky having two girls that my two years in, when we did my GCSE options, I did GCSE Spanish and I was the only boy in class. So that was a real, that was my education piece. That was where I knew about bra sizes, periods, you know, everything. And I was just like a sponge because I was, you know, Gladys <laughs> never told me anything about that. What, you bleed every month? Really? You know, that that was kind of, uh, that was my education, GCSE Spanish with Mrs. Crompton. I bet those girls loved saying things as well to make Oh, they said it on blush. purpose. Yeah, yeah, They yeah. said it on purpose. And they'd leave things you know, panty pads in my desk and and (laughs) leave them in my bag and all that kind of stuff. But as you grow, as I kind of went into sixth form and then university, none of that fares me. It still doesn't faze me to this day. And that's, you know, those are open conversations that we've had with our kids. Yeah. And I feel really proud that I've been at the forefront of those. Yeah. So wonderful. What is life like now as a dad? It, like, do you look back at previous, like life before kids and just go, wow, it's kind of, it's so far removed? Or do you still see a part of that version of you in you now? I think, it, I think there's a nice balance. Hmm. I think there's a nice balance of, of where we're at now and where we were then, because there's still that young well, not young anymore, but that naivety of having kids, yeah. you know, where you think, oh, it'll be all right. They'll know about that. Well, they don't know about that <laughs> unless you tell them about that. You know, uh, we're getting into driving now. And God, it was that must be so scary. Yeah, but it's really exciting because I love learning to drive with my dad. So going back to what we talked about before, I am basically a mirror reflection of my father teaching Phoebe how to drive. I, I just, I'm saying exactly the same things. I'm doing exactly the same things. And I'm making myself laugh whilst she's driving the car because I'm like, oh my gosh, I am so Norman right now. You know, <laughs> uh, because I, we sat down and before she even turned the key, I said exactly the same thing that my dad said to me when I, I got in my first car at like eight, nine, because he's a lorry driver and it's what you do. Yeah. He said, right, it's not a toy. It can kill people. And then Phoebe looked at me like, what? I'm like, sorry, I'm just repeating what Grandad said to me. <laughs> it's so ingrained, it's just coming out. Yeah, yeah. Don't stop it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's been fun. And every day is a journey. Every day is a new experience. You know? And I'm yeah. loving watching them blossom and bloom into, into adults. You know, like mm. we've, Obviously, we, we, we're yet to get to the teenage years with Amber. But I think she's got, like like her sister Phoebe, so much personality and character that you can't help but enjoy it. Yeah. You know, like it, it's it's great having like Phoebe's already prepared a Reading Festival outfit, and I'm so excited. She's like, what do you think of this for Reading? And I'm like, yeah. It's a, Isn't know. that a massive part of it though? Kind yeah. of stopping the noise because we all feel like we've got it's. I don't know, there's this risk assessment, there's the organising, there's all these different parts of parenting. And actually, sometimes you just got to push it all away and just enjoy it. Yeah, enjoy it. You know, Phoebe's going out there and, and she's like, we're, we're just ready to rock and roll, basically. Uh, and it's great to witness because I remember I remember getting the tickets for... I think we. It, there must be an element of, of reflection in watching your kids doing what you've done. Mm. You know, because in the 80s... Growing up in the 80s, you've got to remember the Beatles were only 15 years prior to that. 
So if you look at where Phoebe is now, she's 16. Oasis was the 90s. Yeah. And we're still talking about that. Yeah. So that's still got some kind of influence on them. And then she's slowly discovering house music and dance music. And that's that generation that I was involved with. So for my parents, when I got into the Beatles, it only seemed for them, for my dad, it only seemed like yesterday that they were going watching the Beatles. Mm -hmm. But know. there is that joy when your kid like loves music that you have loved. Yeah. Like we have it with the boys with like ACDC and Weezer and everything. And you're just like, yes, I'm exactly. so glad you're asking for this song. You know, yeah. not just what listening to Disney on repeat. We're doing something else now as well. How do you feel looking forward and thinking about the girls leaving home? Because it's going to happen at some point, quite likely. I've not thought about I honestly, G, I've not thought about that. I've thought about boyfriends arriving on the door. <laughs> what, like, what, do you think, <laughs> what do you think it's going to be like? Uh, Have you had to deal with that at all yet? No, not yet. Okay. Not yet, but it's coming. <laughs> uh, I, reckon, I reckon you'd just kill it with kindness. I reckon oh, you have a well, big to be smile. On, to be honest with you, G, I think I would do exactly the same as if your boys came around. I'd just get the toys out of the garage. <laughs> and if you can swing a golf club, bonus. If you can throw an American football, double bonus. Uh, if you can build a rope swing, triple bonus. <laughs> but that, that's got to be your test. Don't even tell them what to do. Just give them the stuff. Or just don't. Say, yeah. come on. You want you want to date my daughter? Then... Entertain me. <laughs> yeah. There's the garage. Go get your tools. See yeah, what exactly. You can do. Exactly. Yeah. An initiation into the family. Yeah. Can you imagine? Oh my life. So funny. <laughs> yeah. No. I, I, every every day is like a you know the next step is driving mobility. Yeah. Phoebe being able to go and do what she does, uh, what she wants to do when she wants to do it. Mm. Um, then it's hopefully university or college, and then that's you're up and running then. Yeah. But I mean, oh, you're getting closer to like hearts being broken, Vernon. I know. As much know. as, you know, we all know it happens as much as we don't want it to. You, you yeah. can't stop that from happening. Yeah, but like Tess is really good at those big conversations. Is she? Really good. Yeah, really good. Because she's, you know, Tess left home at 17 and lived in Japan for, for two years. So she's been there and done it. And, yeah. you know, life experience is, is what it's all about, being able to share it and reflect. I guess you both left home relatively early, didn't you? Because you moved down. To, how old were you when you moved down to London? I was 22 when I moved down. Uh, but my kind of from college was all about working hard. That was because yeah. I, I just living for the weekend, I'll be honest with you. You know, I, I had a great group of friends who are still my friends now. And we just had a really, really good time. So I was grafting, grafting, grafting just to get that ticket to the Hacienda. <laughs> uh, that's all that matters. I know it sounds a bit lame, but that's all that matters. And then... When I realised what I wanted to do uh, after moving out to London, that's when I really kind of knuckled down and all that stuff that we talked about earlier on about having a work ethic and yeah. programming yourself to work out, that's when all that kicked in. Mm. If you could write a letter on fatherhood, who would it be to and what would you say? Wow. I'd write it to me, age 16. Okay. Yeah, and it would. I would basically just pen everything that's happened uh, with kids like I'd, I'd write like that manual that we talked about at the very very start there are so many manuals out there so many instruction pamphlets and what you do but it's, it would just be yeah forget all of that this is what you've got to do you know just do this if you stick with these three rules then that is it forget sanitizing forget disinfecting everything just stick it in your mouth suck it and then hand it over <laughs> you know <laughs> people are like no don't do that uh but come on, we've all done it. Yeah. Uh, you know, just, just, yeah, just my own manual to me. I think, I know that sounds really selfish, but it would eradicate all that fear and, and kind of gooiness that you get when you're kind of stepping into thinking about fatherhood and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Well, so much of it is there, there's fear, there's judgment, there's pressure. You worry Ju about what other people are thinking. Judgment is massive. Mm. If you are about to have a kid, just put blinkers on and you do what you think is right because at the end of the day it's no one else's child but yours and that's what's important like forget what people think about your pram or you know the, the stupid stuff oh how can you dress your baby like that like, pff, yeah. whatever it's none of your business yeah you know i always uh, think that people are so passionate about whatever 
has worked for them because they've gone through stuff and they found what works for them. So that, therefore they're passionate about it. But that doesn't mean that whatever they're passionate about is going to work for you. I feel like we all have to go through this thing where we're like plucking all these different tools that we've heard about and kind of going, just chuck it out and go, no, that didn't work. That didn't work. Oh, hold on. This works. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Because, and also whatever method you've tried has worked for you because let's be honest, we ain't tried anymore. <laughs> you know yeah you've gone oh we'll do that oh it works great no need to yeah. change you know and the one thing that was a real real uh turning point for us was phoebe never slept oh. so with amber we we're like right we are just gonna be brutal you know really? fed new nappy happy baby you are sleeping and we're not gonna go and, and go and ponder and and, and and go to you every whim which is yeah, what we did yeah. with phoebe which kind of broke our backs it's so hard, isn't it? And that's the thing is that you get told so so often, oh, building a rod, making a rod for your own back there. You're yeah. Like, oh my gosh, I just go through a series of series of different rods, but you know, each time it's a little bit better. Yeah, don't do it. Time. If they start crying, don't do it. Make sure they're fed. Make sure they got a clean nappy. Don't go. Don't go. But they're crying. I know it's brutal. <laughs> but trust me, in three days' time, you'll have a full night's sleep. It's so hard when they're not sleeping. Yeah, you know, it I, is. I, it, you know. Three and a half years she didn't sleep. No. Yeah. So she'd have literally have been like sleeping and then you'd have, you, uh, yeah. <laughs> the next baby was coming along. Yeah, it was crazy. It was bonkers. But then thankfully she fell asleep and then with, with Amber we're like, this isn't happening again. Yeah. This is killer. Yeah. And it didn't. It just affects every single thing. Yeah. It's a huge, it's a snowball effect, isn't it? Like you can't sleep, yeah. can't work, can't work. Yeah, you know, performances uh, drop this, that, and the other. It's like, oh, it's all because you're knackered. Yeah, yeah. And how you are with each other, like I still feel it now with Tom. Like there's sometimes where I'm just so snappy. I'm just, I just, <laughs> I, so I have to turn around and go. I'm just really tired. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why in the jungle, when we sorry in the castle, I, I just I've got to sleep. I just yeah. like, there's many times where the share's long. I was on that up more than we, I was in bed because when you're tired, you, you just can't, it's difficult. It's tough. It really mm. is tough. So I, I didn't want to, to kind of snap at anyone or not that I would in that group, but I just didn't want tiredness to be the key power player in that room. Yeah. You know, because there's so much positive energy within our group Yeah. that I didn't want to just be down in it. And also, the chaise long probably a little bit more comfy than the pile of coats you were sleeping with at the time. <laughs> yeah, there is that. Yeah, there is that. <laughs> because you didn't fit in a hammock or a yeah. bed. <laughs> <laughs> and Just that is every very night, true. everyone handing you their coats, going, "Here yeah. you go. Here's your bed." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very funny. <laughs> okay, I end each podcast with you finishing. Three sentences. All right, go for it. the first one is, being a dad means? Everything to me. Everything to me. It really does. Uh, I couldn't have asked for two better gifts from baby Jesus. Simple as that. Since having children, I? Well, that's a good one. Realised it's not about me. (laughs) Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because I think up until when I moved to London, it was like, right, I need to do something with my life. I need to, and, it, and then telly came along and it was all about, right, uh, work, work, work. How can I get the next gig? What is the next gig? And, and Tess says that one of my faults is I never celebrate the moment. I'm never in yeah. the moment because yeah. I'm always thinking about what's next because being mm-hmm. freelance and working in an industry where it's really difficult to, to crack on, I'm always one step ahead of myself. It's like, right, so we're doing this. What's next? What's next? For me, it was always what's next. And there were some moments early in our relationship where it, work came first, you know, yeah. because I'm in an industry, I'm, I'm actually making waves in an industry, which is really a tough business to crack. So that was priority. And it was all about career, 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 career. And then when the kids came along, it's like, that's got to stop. Yeah. That's got to stop, you know, because it's that cliche. Oh, they grow up so quick. They do. <laughs> Yeah, they do. You celebrate from the minute you're celebrating the first birthday, you're on to sixteen. You know, so I think it made me realise that all that has got to stop. It, mm. It's it's about us. We it went from 
me to us to all of us yeah uh, and i think that's a, an amazing transition when you realize that then it, it gets a lot easier and i'm happy when we're all together 100 percent. yeah where it doesn't matter where we are as long as we're all together uh that's when we're happiest as a family you know and, and when and and when they're all smiling and giggling and, and when we're giving each other a bit of stick, but then those moments where, you know, something has happened in the world and you have to explain those sombre moments as well. Mm. Nice balance. But yeah, when we're all together is amazing. Were you surprised by how emotional you got in the castle whenever the girls were mentioned? Because I guess you've, have you ever had that period of time, you would have been away for work, but never had that period of time where you couldn't talk to them. No, that, that's why I said the answer so quick because when we're all together, it's brilliant. Yeah, you know, I have such a laugh. Look, <laughs> and it, it, but it's it's that moment when you're walking down the street and one of them grabs your hand. You're like, <laughs> I'm doing it now. I'm like, oh, it just it's amazing. It's amazing. You're just you're holding doing hands. It now. And you're literally I know. just in the other room from them. You can go <laughs> <your hand. laughs> I know. It's because everyone knows. Listening, you, as a parent, you're proud as as punch of what you've created. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's what it is. Because they're a reflection of you. Mm. They're, a, they're an absolute reflection of you. And that's hopefully what people will gather from my journey on the pod is that I'm just a reflection of my parents. Yeah. My parents are a reflection of their hardworking, uh, working class Boltonians. And that's filtered down. And, you know, we're in a different situation with my kids with Tess and I. Yeah. But that work ethic is still the foundation of everything that they will be about. Mm. And that comes from our ancestors or our, our family timeline. Yeah. Because once that disappears, that's something I really, really, I, 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 I'm passionate about, is putting a work ethic into your kids. Mm -hmm. Because we live in an era now. And it's hard, isn't it? It's doing that, but without turning into, you know, the whole, where when I was young, I yeah. had to do this, you know. It's kind of finding those lessons in their world. Yeah. I love the thing that you were saying about the hand because it makes me think of it doesn't matter what's going on in the day. I, like, it could be the worst day ever, but that little hand, that little look, that little unasked for hug, you know, yeah. it is, there's just. Which get more and more rare the older they get. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, is that something that you've been aware of? That kind of, oh, Vernon. Yeah, you've got to lean in now. It's like, <laughs> Get off! <laughs> yeah. Vernon, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking. Oh, thank you, G. Loved that. Nice seeing your face. And yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was oh, great dear. fun. <laughs>